this one here. Okay, in this problem, uh, like I mentioned last time, you wouldn't have to draw this. Uh, in the past, we had to draw this, but not anymore. Uh, but we want to be sure to identify all the nodes. Find N. And then we're going to mark the places of the highest electron density of the atom. So, first, the nodes. Well, the nodes are anywhere across the axis. That'd be one, two, or three. Okay? Anywhere up with the black dots right there, those are all nodes. Okay? These nodes would exist there at uh, x equals. Well, the one in the middle is halfway down, so that's L over 2. There's one a quarter of the way down, L over 4, and there's one three quarters of the way down, 3 quarters L. Okay? So at x equals the L node, that's the node. Oh, those are three nodes. Okay. What would N equal? N is number of nodes minus one. So that means if uh, or nodes is n minus or n plus one, if nodes is n minus one, so there's three nodes, n is four. So n's one greater than the number of nodes. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, mark the places with the highest electron density with an asterisk. Well there you look at the psi square diagram that represents probability density, or where you're most likely to find the electron. So I'm going to put some asterisks at the top of the piece right there. Okay, so that's where you're most likely to find the electron. There we go. And that's about it with this part, this uh, what's called particle in a box, or a two-dimensional representation of a wave function, just to get us warmed up mentally to the three-dimensional way. Any questions on this? Okay, so you should be able to find n, number of nodes, find the place where the highest electron density. Also notice it wasn't this question, but where the nodes are, uh, that's the lowest electron density, or uh, at a node, uh, the wave function equals zero, or the probability of finding electron. Okay, let's move on. We have a couple other examples to do as well. Let's try this one. This has to do with quantum numbers. Quantum numbers. We want to know which of the following are allowed. So sometimes uh, certain quantum numbers are not allowed. So let's figure that out. What you do in these sort of questions is you ask yourself, well, in the case of 3F, what's n equal? Yes, the first number, 3. L is equal to F, which is what number? Let's make our little side chart here. L goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And that's S, P, e, D, F. So that's equal to the number 3. Okay, so make sure you all make this chart on your exam if you don't have it handy in your mind. And so is it possible that N and L are equal? No, that's bad. L should always be at least 1 less than N. Okay? So at 4F is okay, or 5F, or 6F. As long as N is larger than F, uh, L, that's okay. Or it could have been a 3D, or a 3P, or a 3S. Anywhere that causes N to be larger than L would have been fine. <coughs> so in the next case, uh, N, <coughs> N equals 4, what's L? 2, so you just look at the table here, if it's the letter D, L is 2, 
So in this case, n is bigger than l. This is totally fine. This is an allowable case. So the first one's not allowed because n and l are equal. But in the second case, n is bigger than l, so that's allowed. That's OK. You can have a 4d orbital. You wouldn't be allowed to have a 3f orbital. Let's try the next one. In this case, n equals 8, l equals s, which is 0. In this case, n is larger than l, 8 is larger than 0. So this is totally fine. Check. That one works. As long as, again, the numerical value of n is larger than the numerical value of l, <laughs> it's allowable. It's uh, allowable for me. Okay, next, let's do the next one. Here, the first number is represents n, that's 2. The second number is L, which is D, which is the number 2. Is that okay? That wouldn't be okay, because in this case, n equals L. So they can't be equal, or L can't be larger than n. All those are not allowed as far as quantum numbers go. And so 2D is not possible. A 3D would be okay, because that means n is bigger. Or 4D or 5D, etc. All those would be okay, but not 2D. Okay, let's try the next one. Here, n equals 4. L equals the letter F, which if you look on a little chart, is 3. So far, so good, because n's larger than L. M sub L, just as a little refresher, remember M sub L has to be anywhere between positive L and negative L. So if L is 3, M sub L could be between minus 3 and plus 3. So it could be minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, or 3. So in this case, having said that, can m sub l be minus 3 if l is 3? Yeah, that's okay. So that m sub l could be anything from 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 or plus or minus 3. So that's okay. This orbital checks out. You could have a 4f orbital where m sub l is negative 3. Let's try the next one. Okay, here n equals the number 4 first number listed. L equals the letter D, which is the number 2. First of all, is that okay? Yeah, that's allowed because N is larger than L or 4 is larger than 2. So that's allowable. That's the orbital is okay so far. So if L is 2, what are all the possible values for M sub L first of all? 1 plus or minus 2, anything else? No, remember if L is 2, M sub L is bounded by negative 2 and positive 2. So it would be uh, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, or 2. In that case, uh, plus 3 is not an allowable quantum number, so this orbital wouldn't work. So that could say 4D M sub L equals plus 2, or 4D M sub L equals minus 1, any one of these five numbers would be okay. But uh, it doesn't list that number, it lists another number, so this last one's not allowed. Any questions on any of these? Okay. Let's try the next one. This is another way, another way to write a quantum number question. Find all the allowable quantum numbers for each case. So we're going to find all the allowable quantum numbers for each case. So uh, if n equals 5, we want to say what all would be possible. Well, if n equals 5, let's start with L. Numerically, L could be, what's the largest L could be? 4. 1 less than 5. Could be anything else. It could be 3 or 2 or 1. Anything else? Yeah, it can go all the way down to zero. So those are all allowable values for L. Let's try M sub L. 
these kind of cases, when there's multiple L's, just pick the largest one and write down the possible M sub L bounds, because it would include all the others. So M sub L, uh, L is 4, it is for 4, then M sub L could be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, could it be plus or minus 4? Yeah. Okay. Those are all the value, all the possible values for M sub L. <coughs> Okay, let's try the next one. <coughs> if L equals 2, let's start with M sub L. M sub L could be 0, plus or minus 1, anything else? Plus or minus 2. Remember, if L is, whatever L is, M sub L is between positive L and negative L, or plus 2 and negative 2. Okay. N, what's the smallest N could be? Three, could it be anything else? It can't be two. Could it be four? Yeah, it can be bigger than L. Could it be five? Yeah, to infinity. Etc. etc. Anything lar equal to three or larger is possible if L equals two. Alright, let's try another one. Okay, now we give a specific M sub L value. So, what's the smallest that L could be if M sub L is negative 5? Yeah, if M sub L is minus 5, L could be 5. Because remember, uh, M sub L is between plus L, 5 in this case, and minus L, negative 5. Okay, could L be anything else? It could be 6, because 6 would include a minus 5. And 7, dot, dot, dot. So any number 5 or larger would include an M sub L value of a negative 5. Okay, now based on L, what's the smallest N could be? Yeah, if L the smallest is 5, then N could be 6 in that case because n has to be at least one larger than l, or 7, or 8, etc. Okay, let's try the last one. L. If l is 0, let's try m sub l first. I think that will be the easiest. What's m sub l? 0. Anything else? That's it. So if L is 0, M sub L is between plus L, 0, and minus L, 0. So in that case, it's just 0. And N, could it be 1? Yeah, 2? Yeah, 3, dot, 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 et cetera. So anything 1 or higher, uh, N could be any number left. OK, any question? On this one, I think this is our last example. Yeah. I'll leave this here if you're still talking. Okay. Check. I don't think we'll quite finish chapter 7, but we'll get towards the end of it today. Okay? So, following along. We're getting towards the end of chapter 7 right now. We're going to tie some concepts together in this lecture. If you bathe, I know it was crazy long time ago, last week, we ended with this table here. Uh, this table, the quantum number table. I wouldn't recommend you memorize it, but you should be able to generate it. And knowing this, you can answer the kind of questions that we just did. Okay? So we just did two standard types of questions about quantum numbers. There's others as well. Uh, on YouTube, I have some quantum numbers one and quantum numbers two if you want to check out some sample videos of different examples. And we related that to the orbits from the Bohr model of the atom at the 
and the last time where uh, there was the orbit. What we did before is there's orbit one, two, three, etc. But now there's some sort of fine structure in there. There's orbit 1s, and then there's two of the orbit 2 pin on L. So L kind of separates out the orbits a little bit. Okay. Oh, let me show the... Uh, last section over here on the right. We did quantum numbers. We introduced the 3D orbitals. I would like to tie those together. So that was page 55 of the reader. I'm going to show you again page 66 of the reader. You remember this freak out moment last week when you saw this. These are the 3D wave functions. Okay. It's in your textbook, in your reader, I got this posted online. Uh, we did this first, and then second we did some quantum numbers. I'd like to tie that up a little bit now, those two concepts. Okay, let's say, for example, we had a, a psi of 1s wave function. Okay. Last time, we found that you can factor that up into the r, which is the radial part, and the y, the angular part of that wave function. Okay, the radial and the angular part. From this table now, I am literally going to copy the 1s part of the r, this box right here. I'm going to copy that right now, and the s part of the y. So I can multiply those two together for y of the 1s wave function. So I'm going to put those two together. Okay? And I'll do it in the, well, it won't really matter, but it'll be in the spherical polar units. Okay? So I'm literally going to copy from the table right now. So 2z over a naught to the three halves power e to the minus sigma over 2 times 1 over 4 pi to the 1 half, where uh, sigma at the bottom of the table equals 2zr over n a naught. Okay. So this is actually one of the simpler ones of the wave functions. Uh, by the way, in this case, what's n? What value, numerical value of n right now? If it's a 1s orbital, 1 is n. Okay? I'll write that down. In the case of the 1s orbital, just like we were doing earlier, n equals 1. By the way, what would l equal? 0, because s is 0. Okay, so that's 1. Z would depend on the element. For example, if the element were hydrogen, what would Z be? On the periodic table. Z represents the what? Atomic number from chapter 2. Capital Z is atomic number, so that's just 1 for hydrogen. It would be 2 for helium, 3 for lithium, etc. A naught is constant. Pi is just that constant, 3.14. So uh, we have this wave function. You could, if you wanted to, uh, graph this on your graphing calculator. This one it might be able to handle without too much problem. But once you get into the other ones, it would get a little more complicated. And it would start to smoke and wheeze. Uh, or what's helpful and why we're connecting the quantum numbers is that if you remember, L represents shape. In this case, L is the letter S. Does anybody remember the shape for the letter S? Yeah, S represents a sphere, which we would draw as a circle. And so you could simply 
knowing the value of L, just draw a circle, as opposed to having to graph this on your calculator. So instead of graphing that function that you see on the top, just knowing it's a one s orbital, you know it's a sphere. By the way, how many nodes would this have? Zero. N minus one, one minus one would be zero nodes. Okay? So this is the beauty of quantum numbers. If I know the name of the wave function, in this case 1s, and I know L specifically, I can just draw it. Okay, easily, I don't have to use a calculator or some program, mathematical uh, program uh, to be able to draw it, at least for the purposes of our class. So what I'm going to do is remember there's S, P, D, and F. I'm going to show you what all those look like with some artistic renderings that because I assume you have no artistic ability, you wouldn't be able to draw. But uh, then I'm going to show you how a normal humanoid like me or you could draw these things, okay? Such that a TA looking at it could say, oh, that's what you're trying to do. Okay, so we're going to be in around page 69 of the reader and in the textbook. We're about 276 and following. So first, so again, first is the artistic renderings. Okay? So the first orbital is an S orbital, and I'll kind of show it like this. This is how artists would draw a 1S orbital. Okay? So 1S orbital just looks like a sphere. Okay, just a circle. Uh, now, a 2s orbital, I'm about to show you, how many nodes would a 2s orbital have? 1, because n equals 2, and so you can calculate the nodes to be 1. Here's what, how they would draw it. On the outside, you wouldn't see the node, but it's internally, it's a concentric circle within the node. Okay, a 3s orbital does have how many nodes? 2, and here's what it looks like. Okay? All right, and you can find images like this on Google. Uh, so three has to have two concentric circles as nodes. A node represents a place where an electron would not go, a forbidden region of sort, a not allowable area. Okay, why do the circles get bigger when the spheres get bigger? There's more. Uh, yeah, I, you could say there's more orbits because n is larger. But I'm looking for a different answer. A simpler answer. As n gets larger, n represents size, so it just gets larger. Okay? So as n increases, you should know size increases. So a 4s would be larger. A 5s would be even larger, etc. Okay, there's the s's. That's an easy one. Your book has similar pictures that you can look at. And there's also something related to the probability of finding the electron in that, that we're not uh, a little bit outside our curriculum. Now, what's the next orbital after the S? L equals 1. What's the letter that goes back? P. P. That looks like a dumbbell. Oh, I actually have one. Is that? Here is a p orbital. Okay, for a p orbital, l equals one, right? So what's the smallest value for n? Two. Has to be bigger. So two p is the lowest energy p orbital. How many nodes would a two p orbital have? And if you're not going to remember this, make sure you write it down. How many orbitals would a two p orbital have? Just one, because n is two, 2 minus 1 is 1. And that node is right here in the middle, splitting the, in this case, the yellow and the red part, right down the middle, right there. Okay? So there's one node. So this would be a, this is a wooden model of it. That has one <coughs> node. Uh, artistic rendering would look something like this. Okay? There's artistic rendering. Now let me go back to scratch paper for a second here. If we had a 2p orbital, n is 2, l is 1, nodes, there's just one actually, 
All right. And then m sub l has how many values? I guess what are the values of m sub l? 0 plus or minus 1 because m sub l is between plus l, plus 1, and negative l, negative 1. So do you see how there's three values? That, there's a 0, there's a minus 1, and there's a plus 1. So you should count 3 right now. That means that there's three p orbitals. Is that okay? Three p orbitals. There's one orbital for every value of m sub l, just like the table we made last time. Okay. That's why there are three p orbitals here in this picture because there's one orbital for every m sub l value. So there's a px, a py, and pz, or really, the, you don't have to technically know this for this class, it's p negative 1, p0, and p positive. Okay? So the minus 1, 0, and plus 1 go with the different digits. Uh, but there's a px, which is on the x-axis, the py is on the y-axis, and the pz is on the z-axis. <coughs> You'll have to be able to draw not only the s orbitals, but also the p orbitals. Okay? I'll show you again how a normal human will draw it later. Don't try to draw this, because I assume it would look terrible. Okay? Don't do that. Don't be crazy. All right. There's the p orbitals. Here's just a different representation of the p orbitals. The, uh, the two p orbitals all have one node. Later when we get into drawing, I'll show you a 3p orbital and how to draw those numbers. Okay, let's go back to scratch for a second. Let's talk about the d orbital. That's the next one. What's L for D? Uh, 3, 2, yeah. So what's the smallest n can be? 3, one bigger than L. So a 3d orbital is the lowest energy d orbital. A 3D orbital is the lowest energy. You can't have a 2D, can't have a 1D. How many nodes would this have? Yeah, n minus 1 or 3 minus 1, which is 2. Two nodes, we'll look for that. And then, by the way, what's m sub l? Plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, anything else? That's it. So it's between plus l and negative l, or plus 2 and minus 2. So minus 2, minus 1. 0, plus 1, plus 1. Okay, now let's go to the picture. Now that we know that, keep your notes handy while I'm showing the picture. So, oh, how many d orbitals would we expect? 5, 1 for each m sub l value. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's 5 m sub l values, 5 d orbitals. Here they are. I told you already they look like the clover leaf. There was a mistake in this picture. This is the dz squared. So there's the dxy, the dyz, the dxz, dx squared minus y squared, and the dz squared. Okay? Uh, just like the other classes, you get to learn how to draw all of these too. Yes. Joy of all joys. Here is the dxy. This, that's what it would look like. And notice the different colors. I'm not really emphasizing that too much. We'll emphasize the different colors or phases of the orbitals more in chapter 10. But it basically means the yellow part is out of phase with the red part. In the pictures here, they're putting in plus versus a minus. Okay. The orbital had that too. I'll leave this up there. There's one uh, d orbital that's a little funny. It looks like a p orbital. It's the dz squared. Looks like a p orbital with a hula hoop around it. It's this. Okay. Okay, that's the dz squared, but the rest look like clover. Okay, we said that this had two nodes, and if you look at this one here, you can see the two nodes. It's a plane that cuts this way, and a plane that cuts this way. So there's two planar nodes, and this, it cuts it, cuts both axes. Okay, so it's two nodes, this up there. I'll show you again how to draw these later, in just a little bit, actually. All right. Uh, the next orbital is the f orbital. Let's try the f orbital. And again, remember, this when you first see this stuff, it looks really weird. After you get used to it, these problems actually wouldn't be that hard. Okay, f orbital, n equals? 
Oh, let's do L. L equals three. Yeah. And what's the smallest n would be? Four would be the smallest. One bigger than L. So a four f. 5f is possible, 6f, 7f, etc. Uh, this would just be the smallest or lowest energy. Okay, how many nodes are we talking about here? Yeah, uh, n, uh, 3 minus 1, or uh, 4 minus 1, which is 3. m sub l is 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, anything else? Plus or minus 3. It's between plus L, plus 3, and minus L, minus 3. So how many M sub L values are there? Total of 7 different M sub L values. That means there's 7 different F orbitals. Uh, this one, don't worry, you would not have to draw, but I will show you what they look like. There are 8 leaf clovers. Or, there are four of them are eight leaf clovers, three of them are, look kind of like a Pyogo with two hula hoops around. I've got one of them here. Which one did I bring? I, I brought uh, the Fx y squared minus z squared. Looks like this. It's just crazy looking. So we're not going to really deal with this. This one. Uh, or any of the f orbitals too much. Uh, but just so you can see what they look like for completeness. And I'll move that because that's too scary. And here's just an overall picture. We've got the S, the P, the D, and the Fs. I didn't have enough space though to print them all out. But here's five of the seven Fs. Okay. So there's all the orbitals. Okay. So. What we're going to have to do is be able to draw the S, the P, and the Ds. Okay? And we have to know their names. Let me show you how that works. Again, why would we ever care to do this? Again, it tells us about the electron, information about the electron. The other cool part about it is, instead of saying, oh, uh, let's graph a, a 3P, uh, Z orbital, we can and draw it, I'll put in all this stuff, we know, oh, a P looks like a dumbbell. Okay, so knowing what it is, we can kind of avoid it, in our class at least, having to graph these. Alright, let's try normal humanoid stuff here for a second. Uh, the S orbitals, like a 1S. That's easy, you would just draw a circle. If it was a 2s, you would draw a bigger circle. If it was a 3s, you would draw an even bigger circle. Okay, it doesn't even look like a circle, but it's close enough. Okay, how many nodes would the 1s have? Zero. n minus 1 or 1 minus 1 is 0. 2s would have one node, and you would draw it with a dashed line that looks like that. Okay, that's your node. Uh, right. 3s has how many nodes? 2, because n minus 1. And that would have two concentric circles drawn as dashed lines. You got that, and you got that. Okay. That's how you draw the s orbitals, just circles. How about the p orbitals? Let's get to the p's. Oh, what's, the, what's the smallest value for n, by the way? And earlier, how many p orbitals did I say there were? Three p orbitals, because there's three m sub l lines. So there's the px, there's going to be the py, and there's going to be the pz. So a 2px, a 2py, and a 2pz. They're really easy. Okay? They all look like dumbbells, but one's on the x-axis, one's on the y-axis, and one's on the z-axis. Okay? They're, they're different axes, but if you orient your axes however you want, you can just draw them right on the axis. So that's all we want. Now technically, I'll do this in brown. Uh, these are different phases, so they, they'd be 
the different parts of the nose do different colors. Again, I'm not going to focus on that until chapter 10, that they're actually in different phases. Okay, so uh, a 2P has how many nodes, by the way? Yeah, if N is 2, then there's only one node, and the node is here, right in the middle. You should be able to draw that. Here's the node. Okay, so make sure you can label the node and draw the orbital. In the case that, let's say you had to draw a 3PZ, for example. Let's say you had to draw one of those. You would just say, oh, let me draw the PZ, it's right here. So copy that drawing, Z, okay. How many nodes would I be expecting? Yeah, nodes equal to, there's one here, here's one node. Okay, now let's go back, look at the, the S's. See when we added nodes here, we added circles. And same thing here. The second node is a kind of a circumscribed circle inside here. On the top and the bottom, both count as one. Both together count as one. It kind of looks like a circumscribed circle inside the node. And let me get a different pen color out. By the way, and this has been on the final before, sometimes we ask you the type of node. The nodes that are planar or linear, flat, these nodes are called angular. The ones that are kind of circular, okay, with a radius, are called radial. So there's both radial and angular nodes. So if I was going up here to the circle or the sphere, the S orbitals, these are what kind of nodes? Radial nodes. Okay, are there any angular nodes in the sphere? No, not at all. Okay. Okay, next. Let's go to the D's. What's L equal for D? Two, so what's the smallest value of N? Three, one bigger than L. How many nodes? Two, okay? And M sub L is zero plus or minus one plus or minus two from L equals two. So there's five D orbitals. Okay, let's draw that on the next page. Okay, there's five D orbitals. You have to learn these. They're, they're three go together and then the other two kind of go together. So there's the DXY, the DYZ, and the DXZ. The three permutations of those X, Y, and Z letters. The XY is on the XY axis. Hopefully that makes sense. The YZ is on the YZ axis, and the XZ is on the XZ axis. There's three of the five so far, and when you draw them, you draw a clover leaf, a four leaf clover, in between the axes. Okay? These should all look identical, even though on mine they don't. Okay? Those all should look identical. They're all in between the axes for which they're on. So dxy on the xy axis, all the orbitals in between it. Yz, xz the same. Would it matter if... <coughs> so the dyx, yeah, you wouldn't do that. She's asking, do you call it yx? No, put it in alphabetical order. That's just not conventional. So you put, put D, Z, X. You do D, X, Z. Okay, there's two more of the five. Let me draw the two last ones. These kind of go together. There's the D, X squared minus Y squared and the D, Z squared. Uh, let's try the X, Y axis. For this one, so the letters tell you the axis. That's a little mnemonic you can use. And the Z axis. Okay, let's get a different color now. Notice how the ones without squares are off axis. The ones with squares are going to be on axis. Meaning, these are going to be on these axis right here. Oh gosh, that was huge. Okay. Those are four equal lobes, except for that brainiac one on the top. 
it's supposed to be four equal resized lobes on the x, y axis. So it's just on the axis. The dz squared is also on the axis. You draw what looks like a p orbital, but with a little hula hoop circle around it, a donut around it. Okay, these five you need to be able to draw, and that has been actually a question on an exam, even on a final. It would say draw all five D orbitals. Okay, let's just make sure we know where the nodes are. Again, how many nodes did we say there were? Two. The nodes are the axes, they're actually planes. So, one, two, one, two, one, two. Uh, and then this one, the nodes are this way. One, and two, this is the dz, uh, the dx squared minus y squared. Now here, here, and there. Okay? But the last one, I wouldn't have you draw it, but people are really curious sometimes. They're conical, two conical nodes. Okay. All right. Now, let's say, for example, uh, we have to draw a 3DXY. A 3, oh wait, not 3, we just did that one. 4, 2, 4. 4 DXY. What would that look like? You go XY and I copy this DXY picture. So I'm going to copy that DXY picture that I just drew. Trying to make it look somewhat symmetrical, somewhat reasonable. There we go. How many nodes does a 4DXY have? Yeah, it would be uh, n minus 1, which is 4 minus 1, or 3. Let's label those nodes. There's a node here. There's a node here. Okay, in the other pictures, when I ran out of nodes that were obvious, where would they be? There are circumscribed the radial node on the inside. And that, let's see if I have a different color, I'll do purple. Just draw kind of a circle wherever you want it, it's noticeable on the inside. And all four of these parts here represent one node. And that's, in the purple, this is the radial node. And the planar ones are the angular. Is that okay? A little crazy the first time you see it. As you draw more, you see they all follow the same pattern. Uh, what we're going to do now, let's take a little break. After the break, I'm going to show you a picture. You want to have to draw it of a five. What is it? I think it's a 5DXY. Yeah, a 5DXY. So it's a 